Mailbag. Nothing personal. Word of the day is mailbag. We have a mailbag bonus episode for you. Here's how it works. You're supposed to follow Nothing Personal on Spotify. You're supposed to rate and review on Apple. For some reason, people, I don't know who, maybe Coca, maybe other people at CBS or other companies, they follow people who subscribe to your YouTube channel, the number of Twitter followers you have, the number of Instagram followers you have at David P. Sampson, although that's really sort of a personal Instagram. And on Apple, you can rate five stars and you can write a review. And what I've been doing with Coca for the past, I don't even know how long it's been going on, Coca, but maybe eight months, maybe it's more. We've been doing a mailbag episode where when you write a review within Apple's podcast, Nothing Personal site, and within that review, you ask a question, I'm going to take an episode every once in a while. We do it at the end of the month, but here we are in, you know, in the middle of the month, and I answer them. And here's how it goes. I read the question, I answer it, I go to the next question, and I don't want to waste a second of time because there's so many questions that we're just going to start. Mailbag. If inside information was being reported that the organization didn't want to be released, would you attempt to discover who was leaking the info? And how would you deal with the person if discovered? Alternatively, what was the process for intentionally leaking info that the organization wanted to be made public? I love this subject. I wanted to lead off the show with this because I love talking to you guys about PR and leaking and how we use the media, how we use social media, how we use certain reporters to say certain things, how certain reporters are known to be the leakers for certain agents or certain teams or certain executives. We would keep track. So when when it first started in baseball, it was 1999. It was it was a little different because you had something called beat reporters. Beat reporters, and they still exist today, but they're not as and I say this with great respect toward beat reporters. There is not the imp the impact that beat reporters have has been diminished over time because there are national reporters. There's team social media where they get information out. But a beat reporter would be people who are with the team, they travel with the team if their newspapers allow it and have the budget for it. They work for a newspaper. They meet players before and after the game, the manager before and after the game. And then they write an article, a game recap, because in the old days, that's how you knew whether your team won. You had to actually go to a newspaper and read the result and then a game story. But then there's a note section. This player's hurt. That player's hurt. This player stinks. That manager could be fired. This, this player may be brought up, they were called notes. And the way it worked before social media is that there was a news cycle and it wasn't 24 hours the way it was today. When we wanted a story to be out, we knew the deadline because our PR department would say, the Miami Herald has a deadline of 11 p.m. The South Florida Sun Sentinel has a deadline of 10.30 p.m. The Journal de Montréal, when I was in Montreal, their deadline is 1045. The Montreal Gazette has 11. You get my point. If you give information to the media through what at that time was faxing statements and press releases, believe it or not, and you did it at the after a deadline for a newspaper, that story would not be told, written about, or heard about by anyone until the following day's newspaper. So you had an entire day to figure out what you were going to do with that specific issue that was in front of you. Once social media started and once online started where you could read articles online, there was no deadline anymore. So you actually couldn't wait and withhold information. So then we changed and just gave information as it happened. When that started, we then started introducing the concept of purposeful information dissemination. Sometimes the information we would disseminate would not be accurate. Those were purposeful leaks. Sometimes information was received by the media or by a blogger or by a credentialed person who had an online presence that we did not want out there. And that was called an accidental leak. The Marlins suffered from major leaks. Major. I'm talking about it was, this is no hyperbole. I would say 
five to 7% of my day every day as I think about my time allocation as a president of a team was spent dealing with media and leaks and how information was getting out, what we were doing to get information we wanted out or stopping information that we didn't want out from getting out. That's a huge amount of time if you think about it. Although when you don't sleep a lot, it may not be a number, a great number in terms of minutes and hours, but in terms of percentage of a day, it's a lot. And it was something that bothered me because I wanted to be the one who was giving out information that I wanted out, or I would assign to people to give information that we wanted out. And we would give it to different writers according to what the information was. During the trade deadline, we were leaking things to national media, whether it was a Peter Gammons or a Ken Rosenthal or a Jason Stark. People would be reporting on trades to John Morosi. And the reason why we would want certain information out is that if we wanted to sign a player, we would put information out there that we didn't want to sign that player. Or if we wanted to sign a player, we would put information out that no other teams were interested. If we didn't want to sign a player, but that player wanted to sign with us, we would put information out that we didn't want to sign that player so that the other teams would know that they're not bidding against us, they're bidding against themselves, so stop raising the salaries. The purpose of getting information out is both competitive and financial when it comes to signing players, right? Competitive is that if there's a bunch of teams trying to get the same player, you want to make it be known to the player, to the agent, and to the other teams that you're serious and that you're going to start spending stupid money. When it comes to trades or injuries, the reason why even today – People like Joe Girardi don't want to give you information about injured players. They don't want to say which pitchers are available, which particular day. They don't want to say how serious an injury is. The reason why you do that and you get the information out that, hey, he has an MRI, but we don't know yet. Of course they know. They know immediately. Is that you don't want other teams to hold you up in a trade when you call them to say, hey, is this pitcher available? Is that third baseman available? Is that outfielder available? You do not want that team to say he is available, but I know you desperately need him. Therefore, I'm going to ask for an extra two prospects or one better prospect than really the player is worth. So there's all sorts of things going on. So when you're reading information out there, you have to know that it is all the result of strings that are being pulled. What would we do when we wanted to catch a leaker? This is true and funny. We would call meetings with different groups of individuals in different departments. We would tell our trainers something. We would tell certain people in the scouting or development department something. We would tell our GM something, although we never set up our GM. Our GM was always in cahoots with us because our GM would never leak stuff. And when our GM would leak stuff, we'd know what he was leaking, at least most of the GMs I had. We would tell our manager something. Hey, we're looking at starting this pitcher, this game. It's a little different than what everyone's expecting, but here's why we're doing it. And we would keep track of what we were saying to different people, and we would wait to see what was released. So we had a logbook of the following information. When it came to the draft, yeah, with our number four pick, we're definitely looking at John Doe. And then if it's out that Marlins look to have interest in John Doe at the number four pick, we would know where that came from because we didn't have an interest in John Doe. We just wanted to see if we could catch a leaker. There were times that we would take cell phone records. There were times when we would meet, I would meet with individual people trying to get them to get their stories straight. The reason why we did that is A, it was fun. Right? What is more fun than coming up with this crazy plan to have all these different bits of information out there to keep track of who you told what and then to figure out who's leaking who? What is better than pulling cell phone records and seeing how often a certain national writer is being called by a certain person in your front office? What is more fun than writing down what time you told someone something and then going to check the phone records, which are company phones, so we're allowed to check the records whenever in the hell we want? and we don't have to tell you. A little hint, if you're on a corporate phone, they're looking. If you have an opportunity to get a phone given to you by your company, don't take it. Ask for reimbursement of your phone bill upon proof of your monthly bill. That would be my big suggestion. Never have a company phone. I never once had a company phone. 
we gave company phones to a lot of people, but I never wanted a company phone. I just said, hey, pay me back. And we then gave opportunities for other people to just get paid a certain amount per month for their cell. But when we do that, we would say, we're doing that for you. We're going to reimburse you for your phone, but it's still a company phone. And often employees wouldn't pick up on that because you get a discount when you're under the Marlins rate, you get a better rate, everything's better. But what it really means is we get to look at your phone lock. And we're not looking to see if you're calling 17 different men or 18 different women. Are you married? Are you single? We don't care. We're not looking at what website you're on to see if you're on RedTube. We don't care. We want to know about things that impact our team. So we're juggling all these different balls in the air. We're having these meetings. And what would happen when we catch someone? And we did. You fire them. That's what you do. So the process for intentionally leaking info is a process that I deem to be not complicated. When I describe it to people, whether I'm giving speeches or whether I'm in an owner's meeting or talking to other team executives and they're asking me about what we do and I tell them what we do and they say, ooh, that seems like a good idea. Maybe we should do that. Just know it is a complete pain in the neck. It takes up way too much of your time. But it's like when you're trying to catch someone doing something like were you ever a counselor at camp and you wanted to catch your camper sneaking out to the girl's side or you were the head counselor at camp and you wanted to catch two counselors doing things they shouldn't be doing and you wake up in the middle of the night and you go look where you know they're going to be and then you find them. It's like a game. Except you could say it's a serious game, right? Because we're playing with people's lives and their livelihood. No, I never looked at it that way. And the reason I never looked at it that way, just FYI, is that when you tell people what the rules of engagement are, Remember a, a few days ago, I remember last week or whenever it was, we talked about Trevor Bauer and him wanting to know what the rules are for foreign substances. When you tell people what the rules of engagement are and then you enforce those rules and you enforce them consistently across the board and across different disciplines within your company, then I don't want to hear one complaint out of an employee when there's ramifications for what they've done. Just don't want to hear it. Thank you. I like that question. Hey, can't wait for the mailbag. All right, you got it. Was really hoping I could get your insight on this. You're about to get it. Left a review on the podcast app as well. Thank you for doing that. One of my favorite stories I've ever heard you tell is when you caught Ricky in Alaska eating pizza at 3 a.m. the night before one of his starts. That being said, how would you describe the relationship between players and the front office? Do you have to refrain from developing close personal relationships with players given the transactional nature of the business? I've touched on this so many different ways, but this question struck me because when you bring up the Ricky Nolasco eating pizza in Milwaukee at 3 a.m. the night before a start and I catch him and then he gets rocked and I'm pissed off even though I've gone out with him in previous cities and even though we're still in touch to this day and even though we've partied, we've had serious talks, we've had unserious talks, We've seen each other in compromised positions. Whatever the case is, there's one thing that you've got to make clear if you are going to have a relationship as an employer with your employees. And that is the entire genesis of this show. You've got to make it clear that sometimes it's just business. Sometimes, no matter how much we party together, no matter how much we joke around or how much time we spend, there are going to be moments when I'm serious as the president of your team and I'm saying something as president to an employee who works with me and for me, and I'm gonna let you know, lest there be any misunderstanding that this is one of those moments. Communication to me is everything. I never had a problem having personal relationships with the players. I never had a problem telling players that they were traded, telling players they were released, telling players we weren't going to pay them, telling players we're going to go to arbitration and then passing notes in the arbitration room and getting in trouble, telling players everything, why we're choosing to call a rain out or a rain delay, when we want to reschedule it for, why we're doing certain things with the team, with the payroll, where we are with our TV negotiations, where we are with fans and ticket sales and corporate sponsorships and naming rights. And I was in the minority. Most team presidents keep a very strong wall between themselves and the players. 
Owners don't do that as much. Owners want to be with players. They want to hang out with players. I'm good with that. That's an owner's job. That's an owner's right. You want a locker in the clubhouse and you're an owner. Dave Dombrowski wanted that too, whatever. You're fine. You want to shoot hoops like Mark Cuban was on last week when there was a, um, I can't remember who the Mavs were playing. They were in the uh, first round and uh, they, uh, Coco, who the, oh, the Clippers. So the Mavs were playing the Clippers and uh, Mark Cuban was shown he was being videoed taking three pointers before the game, like in warmups. And then he goes in the locker and showers and changes and goes to watch the game with his sneakers on. I'm in. You want to buy a team? It's your toy. You're toying with people's emotions. You're toying with people's livelihoods. But frankly, if it's your toy, have at it. As the president of a team, it's not my toy. It's my business. When you are honest with your employee and you communicate when they need to pay attention and when you are talking about something that they need to remember and they need to act on, you can then have the ability to have that personal relationship and business relationship. You cannot count on your employee to know the difference. I didn't even have to learn that lesson. That was just imparted in me when I was a child. You have to know how far you can go because when you go over the line, That leads to tears and it leads to a loss of relationship. And if you don't properly communicate, that also leads to tears and a loss of relationship. And over all of my years, there's only two people I've lost a relationship with. Mike Redmond, the manager who we fired, who never talked to me after. And Mark Burley, the pitcher who we traded to Toronto, who never spoke to me after. And I had very good personal relationships with them. And I did not communicate with Mark Burley the fact that he was going to get traded to Toronto. I did communicate to Mike Redman that there was an issue between Jeffrey and the manager and that the minute he was hired, he was on the watch to be fired. And then he got surprised that he got fired and he got his feelings hurt, blah, blah, blah. And I feel badly for that, actually. But the general relationship between players in the front office is very guarded because players generally don't trust the front office. Front office views the players as pawns in their game, as pieces, not as people. And I was as guilty as that as as can be if there were players who I did not respect as workers or players who I did not respect as getting the most out of their skills, I would let them know that. There's certain players who were just so not nice that I didn't want to have a relationship with them. But sometimes what you're told by old school baseball people is there's a line between the front office and players that you don't ever cross. It's us against them. And that drove me crazy. Because if you have an us versus them in your company, if that's your view toward management or toward your boss, That means by definition, you're not giving your best. And that means that the boss is not getting your best and is not performing and getting the results that he needs or she needs or they need to make their company perform, increase their stock price, get more value, get more revenue, whatever the case may be. Higher profit, doesn't matter. I always felt that the movie Major League was just a movie. That somehow playing because you hate your owner so much and thinking you're going to win because you hate your owner so much because your owner wants to move your team to Florida. That's the concept of the movie Major League. That somehow that was getting players motivated. What motivates players is money. What motivates players is money. What motivates players and employees is money. Compensation. Oh, I'm so proud. Our team won 95 games, and I'm being offered $5 million below what I think I deserve. But we won 95 games, so I'm super happy. It's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. So the relationship between players and front office is strained because it's told to be strained. There's manufactured straining. But it never stopped me from developing close relationships. I appreciate that question. Every front office president, every front office member would give you a different answer to that question, but I'm telling you the truth because that's what I do on Nothing Personal. I tell you exactly how it was. Did it cost me sometimes? Yeah. Did it make GMs and managers not like me sometimes? Yeah. Did it make the owner upset sometimes? Yeah. 
Did everyone say I was doing it wrong? Yeah. Not to me. I think I was doing it right. Okay. Question. What is the state of minor league baseball and the MLB draft? Both saw significant changes last year with COVID. Minor leagues saw a major restructure, a 25% reduction in teams. Not true. There was a reduction in affiliated teams. I fear the owners will see this as another way to save money, more so with limiting the major league draft to fewer rounds and capping what a player outside of the draft can sign for. What direction do you see each of these heading? I think it's a way to cut some expenses. Just don't know if in the big picture to an owner, is it enough to move the needle? Nothing personal. It is just business. Well, thank you for that question. Let me start with a macro concept for you. Player acquisition is the name of the game. Cheap player acquisition is the dream of the game. Cheap player acquisition of players who turn into all-star caliber players is what gets you executive of the year. It's what gets you into the playoffs. It's what makes you valuable and lets you sign a really big, rich deal when you're a GM or a president. Everybody can sign the best free agent in the market. Everybody can sign a Garrett Cole or a Mookie Betts or a Francisco Lindor. That's not that interesting. Find me the Kevin Gausmans of the world. Find me players who are so outperforming their contract. That's where you get the value. What my job was as president was to present a budget to the owner. I presented a budget each year that had my uh, having used all. So what you do is if we want to get into a quick budget talk, we did a zero based budget every year. Some teams do a based on last year's budget where you take what the last year's marketing expense was, you increase it 3% and that's what your marketing budget is. You take what your cost of goods sold is, you increase it by 5% and that's your budget. I wanted a zero based budget, which means I needed every department, every person in the department to explain from dollar zero what they wanted, what they needed, and what they were going to do with that money and how that was going to drive revenue or drive wins. Every line item. So the budget was six inches thick for you know a baseball team. Our budget, at least six inches thick. Takes months and months to do. It's the biggest pain in the ass for employees. I get it. But I went through every line, every page. I then would work with the CFO to have a revenue and expenses. And then are we making money or are we losing money? I'm totally simplifying it, but take your revenue, subtract your expenses. If you have no money left or negative money left, you're in a lost position. You have to knock on the owner's door and say, hey, give me $5 million. If you have extra money left, then you can call the owner at the end of the year and say, hey, we're giving you $5 million. In 18 years, I never got to call the owner and say, hey, we're giving you money. Why? Because part of the budget has a blank in it. I know that sounds crazy. How can that be a blank? There's a line item in the budget for player salaries. Payroll. Payroll is not just taking 25 guys who are on your team, adding up what they're paid that you read about in the paper, and that's your player payroll. Player payroll includes benefits. You know, like the benefits you have, whether it's insurance benefits, whether it's pensions, whatever the case is, that has to get funded by your company, by the baseball team. So there's a line item for benefits. It's millions of dollars a year, by the way. And it doesn't even matter what your payroll is. It's not related to the price of the player. Every team, every player has the same amount of contributions into the pension. There's then a line item for disabled list players. What do you think happens when you have a player who has Tommy John? Let's just take Noah Syndergaard of the Mets, whose salary this year, I can't remember. Let's pretend it's $6 million. He's not been on the team all year. But that $6 million that he's getting paid, guess what? That $6 million that we don't put in the player's salary budget because we only want to put players in that budget who are actually playing on the team. So that goes in a separate category. It's 9.7. Thank you, Coca. So the disabled list level 
salary level is already 9.7 for the Mets, but with all their injuries, it's way, way higher. So you add up all of that and you plug in the number. And why is salary a plug-in? That's a whole nother story. But the reason why salary is a plug-in is because you go to the owner and say, what are you willing to do? How much money are you willing to lose? And if the owner says, I'll lose $10 million, we say we're projected to lose $2 million. We say, okay, we're pushing the player's salary budget up by $8 million. We can go sign another player. That is literally how it works. Owners do not want to hear me say to them, hey, listen, I can cut $10,000 out. All we have to do is we're going to take people's reimbursements for gas mileage, and we're not going to reimburse directors, only vice presidents and above. And we're going to change the policy and just let managers and directors and associates know that they are not getting reimbursed. Or there's a line item for a Christmas party, a $4,000 Christmas party. We're not having a Christmas party. Or there's bonuses that we give. We're cutting bonuses. Or there's extra ads we want to take out, extra social media, extra headcount. We can cut this, cut that, cut that. Total savings, $175,000, $525,000, whatever the case may be. The owner will say, listen, you can do all that and that's fine. Do it. But if we just don't sign a utility outfielder or infielder, a fourth outfielder, utility infielder, that's like $3 million that we can cut. It's way easier when you are balancing a budget to cut payroll than it is to cut a dime at a time. I was interested in the dime at a time because every dime counts and dimes add up. It's how we got a ballpark built on time and under budget because every change order costs money. And even if it's a change order for $1,000, if you've got 100 of them, that's 100 grand right there. And believe me, you've gonna, you're going to have way more than 100 change orders. So to me, I would go line by line. Owners, however, are much more macro based, much more. So, when, so your question is about, in the big picture, is it enough to move the needle for an owner? And the answer is no. On the other hand, lowering the cost of player acquisition, getting slots in the draft was critical for us. Where the rich teams can't give the first pick $40 million, they can only give the first pick $7 million. International slots where you can only use $5.4 million. But if, by the way, you go over the competitive luxury tax threshold, one of your punishments is you could lose some international signing bonus money. All of that is done not just to lower signing bonuses for players who odds are they're not going to make it. It's also to lower in a significant way expenses by a baseball team in order to increase profitability. <sighs> Does that answer your question? I think it probably may. All right, we're going to go to break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about something that happened in Beloit, and I never thought that Beloit would make the show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Nothing Personal Mailbag episode. You've gone on Apple. You've rated. You've reviewed. Please do more. We got to get to like 10,000 ratings, and we're at 2,500 ratings. So please write, rate, review. We need all those reviews. Follow on Spotify. Tell your friends about Nothing Personal because we have fun here every day, 45 minutes. Even when I'm not here, I'm here. Am I here? Am I not here? Where am I? Doesn't matter. I'm with you for 45 minutes almost every day. Have we missed a day? When's the last time we missed a day, Coca? I, I can't even remember the last time. All right, back to your questions. David, thank you for the show, but thank you more for Coca. I always have to bring Coca in. Whenever, if you're going to put Coca in a question, the odds are it's going to be discussed on the show, either in a mailbag bonus episode, maybe it's so you want to talk to Samson. How many of you last week when we talked about Half-Baked, watch Half-Baked? Remember when Clarence Williams passed away? Please tell me he played Samson in Half-Baked. Please tell me you watched Half-Baked as a nod to Clarence. I hope you did. What are your thoughts on the Beloit Snappers plan for naming rights? That is the, it's the shortest question that is on the show. And I want to explain who the Beloit Snappers are. They're a minor league team. Beloit is a place in Wisconsin, Beloit, Wisconsin. Coke, I may be, I may be wrong. 
I went to Wisconsin. I was born in Milwaukee. I am 99.9% sure Beloit's in Milwaukee. I think there may be a school in Beloit, although I could be thinking of Appleton. Appleton is Wisconsin. Damn it, Coca, help me. Where's Beloit? Thank God, he just whispered. It's in Wisconsin, dumbass. All right, sorry, everyone knew that. So Beloit, is their last name is the Snappers. They made an announcement that is completely insane. The way they're selling naming rights to their ballpark is per day. They are charging $1,000 per day to anyone who wants to name the stadium for that day. But if it's a weekend, it's, it's the pricing's higher. It's 1500 bucks. So here's what happens. You pick up the phone and you call someone. Maybe it's a corporate entity in Beloit. Maybe it's, maybe it's a individual season ticket holder. Maybe it's the top 10 richest person in Beloit. And you say, would you like to name our stadium? We're going to name it the John's Tool and Die Stadium. All it takes is $1,000. All right, so let's say that you've got 80 home games and you sell them all for $1,000. You're getting $80,000 a year for a single A stadium. It's not terrible. But what are you selling? What's the benefit? The way naming rights deals work is that you get permanent signage behind the plate, but now that you could have a different name every day, you also get the name on the stadium, so you're not gonna get that. But if it's an electronic marquee, you could just change the name. You could get the broadcasters to refer to it as, welcome to John's Tool and Die Stadium for tonight's game between Beloit Snappers and the John Red Snappers. You could do that. But the reason why companies want to name a ballpark is they want to associate with your sport, with your game, and they want to build brand affinity. They want to be associated with baseball on a more than one game basis. They want to be associated with an arena or a stadium that is hosting more than just a sport. When you name a stadium, you are getting all the events in that stadium. The only reason you would ever ever sell it game by game is the same reason we would sell a behind the plate sign game by game or an outfield wall sign that's digital game by game or a ribbon board sign game by game. There's one reason only. Can you think of it? It's pretty easy to think about. It's because you couldn't sell it for the whole season. Why do you think that you can buy a 10 game season ticket plan? or a five game season ticket plan, or one of these new flex plans where you can buy a seat and you can choose the 20 games, but they've gotta be silver games, not gold games or platinum games, and the blackout on this day or that day or opening day or Yankees, Red Sox or blah, blah, blah. It's all about maximizing the revenue for a particular piece of inventory. And there are analytics that you can do that can tell you how to maximize section 49, row 69, seat six. You can get an actual breakdown of the best way to get the most money for that seat. You can hire a company to look at a piece of signage and say, here is what you can expect and here's how you can expect to get it. It's completely insane to me. Not the analytics part, just naming rights day by day. It's just extra work for your corporate sponsorship people, for your salespeople. And frankly, for 80 grand, I'm trying to find two companies for 40, right? I'm really trying to find one for 70 is better than 80 for 80. How can that be? Wait a minute, Samson, I just caught you. You would rather sell naming rights to one company for 70 grand then find 80 companies for one grand and get 80? Now let me tell you why. Is the scenario that when I can sell a naming rights deal for $70,000, that I'm comparing it to 80 people who have already prepaid the $1,000 to name it a different name each day for the next five years? I'm getting $350,000 at minor leagues for $70,000 a year from one company. And it is a contract and it is certain revenue that I can put into my budget. 
if I get 80 people times five, that's 400 people, and I get them all to give a grand, you're right, I now have 400 grand, not 350 grand over 40 years. Can you promise me? Do you swear to God that there won't be a few Wednesdays without a game? How about a rain out? Do we have to give the money back? What about a double header? Do you switch the name in between? Welcome to the John's Tool and Die game one. Welcome to the Hunt Toyota game two. No. There are words that I've lived by. It may have cost me money sometimes, but I don't think so. A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. I don't even know what the hell that means, except if you can give me money right now, cash money that I can count on, I'd rather take that than a promise. Oh, I promise I'll be there for you. Okay. David, yes, I'm obsessed with your podcast. That semi makes me nervous, but I'm in. I want obsession. Thank you for sharing your experiences, especially for me as a baseball fan. I've always wanted to know more behind the scenes of the business aspect of MLB teams. My question wouldn't appeal to the listeners of the podcast. Uh oh. <laughs> Why do we choose this one, Coca? My question would appeal to diehard baseball fans. I don't want to do that. We're not a baseball podcast, folks. We are ranked very highly in baseball. But why aren't we ranked in like the daily shows, Coca? And where we do sports, all sports, entertainment and politics and culture. Could you work on that, Coca? Because I know that you've got so much support at CBS that you've got plenty of time to work on stuff that can actually increase our exposure and get more downloads and listeners and followers. Anyway, get on that, Coca. My question wouldn't appeal to the listeners of the podcast. Okay. What's easier in terms of expectations? Running a big market team or a small market team? Thanks, David. I will follow you to the end of time. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. It's time for a discussion on small market, big market. Let me define for those of you who are not diehard baseball fans, you know that I don't refer to teams like the Yankees as large market teams or teams like the Indians as small market teams or teams like the Marlins as small market teams. There are two types of teams in baseball, high revenue and low revenue. It's not about the size of your market. Don't care. It's about the amount of your revenue. The Marlins were a low revenue team. The Rays, low revenue. The Royals, low revenue. Red Sox, high revenue. Cubs, high revenue. Yankees, high revenue. People get a chance to work for low revenue teams and high revenue teams as president or GM. So what is easier? Let's talk to Brian Cashman. Hold on, he's calling me. Brian, hey, yeah, I'm doing a show right now. We have a question. I know very quickly. I know you're busy. You got to make some trades. You got to do something. Your team stinks. Yeah, I know. Okay. You're going to fire Boone? Uh, that's a wait to see. I assume that's going to happen. But I think you're not going to make it either. Uh, you may. No, you'll get another job. Maybe. I mean, you've been around for a long time. All right. Let me just ask you a question. How do you feel about the expectations of having to win a World Series every year because you live, live and work in New York? Are you jealous? Are you jealous of like Andrew Freeman when he was with the Rays and he kept winning? Or like... Kim Ng with the Marlins, no expectations. Are you jealous? You're not. You are. What's the? Re I'll, I'll I'll tell everyone right now the reason. I will. It. That's fascinating. All right, thank you, Brian. Brian Cashman, and every other large market high revenue GM will tell you the same thing. There is nothing greater than exceeding expectations in order to improve your worth in the game and to get you paid more money and get points in a team. When you take a team that is in a market where they have no money and they have a low payroll and you perform, you're a genius. When you take a team that has a $200 million payroll and you perform, you were supposed to. When you take a team that has a $200 million payroll and you don't perform, you're fired. When you take a team that has a $50 million payroll and you don't perform, you're not fired because you weren't supposed to perform. But I've got a slightly different take on it. I believe that to be a successful 
executive at a large market team is harder than you think. Now, granted, as a small market team, all of my mistakes, every bad signing, every bad trade, all of that gets amplified because there's no money to replace a player who you signed who doesn't play for you because he stinks. There's no way to replace a player who you traded for who was supposed to be a prospect and ends up not being. You don't have the money to cover up mistakes, which means you are trying super hard not to make them. Believe me, super hard. But when you're running the Red Sox or the Yankees and you sign a guy who doesn't work out, you take a flyer for $12 million on Corey Kluber and he gets hurt. Who cares? If the Yankees were winning without Corey Kluber, Cashman's a genius. If a small revenue team had taken Corey Kluber and done a $10 million flyer and he got hurt and wasn't pitching, you're going to get fired. Does it take a genius to sign Garrett Cole to the Yankees? No. It takes a genius to figure out who you are going to play on your team who's making four to $6 million and is going to play like a $20 million player. It is way easier to run a high revenue team because you get to cover your mistakes, but you do have the burden of expectations. I enjoyed running a low revenue team because I loved the pressure. I loved the feeling that every mistake I made would cost our team everything, our chance to win. I loved running a team where every mistake I made would get amplified and magnified because whether it would be the owner or the fan base or the players in that clubhouse would know that they had no chance to win because we blew our wad on a player who was hurt or not performing or who ended up not being good. That got my blood flowing. Would I have taken a job as president of a big market team, of a large revenue team? <laughs> you bet your ass I would have. Not now. Not with nothing personal. I'm way too happy. But back in the day, would I have loved to have tried to have a $200 million payroll to see what it would be like to sign anyone and not worry if they get hurt? Where I had to explain that we underperformed, but we're going to be fine next year because we've got all this money to go and spend, and here's how we're going to spend it. Believe in me. Trust in me. How else has Cashman kept his job since 2009 without a World Series appearance or a World Series victory? 12 straight years. Is that because Steinbrenner just doesn't want to get rid of him? It's because he built up credibility with the rings he won. It's because he built up credibility with the teams he's built. But eventually that credibility runs out. In general, the runway that an executive has at a low revenue team is greater, assuming the owner understands. And here's the catch. If you run a low revenue team, where the owner has expectations as though you were a high revenue team. If you run a low payroll team, but the owner has expectations that that low payroll is enough to compete year in and year out, you are screwed. And the reason you're screwed is you will never be able to exceed expectations. You will always fall short. And that's when you don't get a good job performance rating. And that's when you get canned. Why do you think we fired all those managers? Because they didn't perform? Because they performed below expectations? No. It's because we had unreasonable expectations for them, and they couldn't hit those expectations, so we would fire them, saying it's not our fault that the payroll is so low. It's not our fault that we couldn't win games or we couldn't raise the money or get better naming rights or get better TV deals, when in fact it was all our fault. Do you know what's worse than being a low-revenue team in a small market? It's been a low revenue team in a mid market like Miami. That just means that I sucked at raising revenue. That question actually sort of make me sad. I loved running the small, small revenue team, small market team. I never really ran a small revenue team in a small market team. I always ran a small revenue team in what should have been a much larger market. And I just couldn't figure out how to tap that market. What's better than tapping that market? I appreciate your question. Oh my God, Coco, what are we going to do? I think we're like at time, but we have way too many questions left to answer. 
All right, I think we're going to have to do another mailbag. I mean, there's just too many unanswered. Listen, I appreciate you were here for this 45 minutes. We give you 45 minutes. This has been the mailbag. And even with mailbags, it's just business. This is nothing personal. 